The 1950s holds a special place in the history of film, and the horror films of that time were no exception. Audiences had enough of the costume monsters that had dominated the genre in previous decades. Soldiers that returned from World War II and families that had experienced loss and trauma didn't want to see films that took place in gothic, fairy tale like settings. They wanted to experience stories that connected to them directly, whether it be at the office or at home. Stories that could tap right into their present day lives. One film that did just that was 1956's Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which to this day is left open to endless interpretations of what frightens us politically, socially, and mentally. And yet the fourth remake, 2007's The Invasion, not only failed to capture what set its source material apart, it failed to carry with it the type of thrills that would normally qualify it in the horror genre. With the original story that seemingly fits into the social climate of each decade, how exactly did this film utterly and completely fail? Let's figure it out together as we once again ask, what the f happened to this horror movie? Right, here's a little backstory. Settle in and just let the nightmare wash over you. The film The Invasion from 07 was based on The Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1956, which itself was based on the novel The Body Snatchers by Jack Finney, published in 1955. Now, the 1956 film had already spawned a remake, also named Invasion of the Body Snatchers, that was released in 1978. So what we're taking a look at is actually the fourth version of the film. In 2005, Oliver Huschenbeagle was hired to direct the film. A relatively unknown director at the time, he was undoubtedly best known for 2004's Downfall. A month after Warner Brothers hired the director, the cast Nicole Kidman to star in the film, and Daniel Craig was hired not long after. Right around this point, the writer David Gaganovich tried to explain in early interviews how the story adapts so easily to contemporary times, saying, You just have to look around our world today to see that power inspires nothing more than the desire to retain it and to eliminate anything that threatens it. So that was the initial approach. Something obviously went wrong along the way. There was enough different about the script this time around that the studio actually considered it an original concept, even though there was very little that was original about it. Because of this, Warner Brothers didn't feel it was necessary to mention the film's source material in any of the advertising. So the title was ultimately changed from Invasion of the Body Snatchers to a title that would in no way, shape, or form resemble the original. That's original. Unfortunately, it was around this time that ABC started advertising their own series called, you guessed it, Invasion, which was also loosely based on Body Snatchers. The film then changed its official title to The Visiting. Even though the series Invasion was critically acclaimed, it was canceled after the first season due to poor ratings, as it aired in the time slot after Lost. Two mythology-heavy shows in a row proved to be a bit too much for audiences. With the series officially over, the film once again carried its title, The Invasion. Everything's a copy of a copy of a copy. Production on the film began in September 2005. Now, there was no visual effects in the film, so production moved along very quickly. Dailies had been sent to Warner Brothers on the regular, and apparently, the studio was unhappy with what was turned in. At one point, an early cut of the film was shown to audiences and was received very poorly. They saw it as more of an art house, dialogue-driven film, and, and not the summer tentpole they were hoping for. Enter the Wachowskis. Perhaps the most discussed aspect of the invasion is the involvement of the Wachowskis. Coming off the massive success of the Matrix trilogy, the Wachowskis were brought on to do rewrites of this script and help with some reshoots. Now, Warner Brothers had taken a chance on them, and that chance led to a very, very bright future. So the two were more than happy to help the studio out of a bind especially since they had, at the time, with the Invasion filming after their Matrix trilogy and before their follow-up effort, 2008's Speed Racer. It's said that the Wachowskis rewrote about 30% of the film after the original vision failed to impress the studios, though some rumors have it been closer to 70, which is basically an entirely different movie. When Horschbeagle was either unavailable or unwanted for reshoots, the Wachowskis reached out to a friend, protege, and frequent collaborator, James McTeague, to come aboard. Now, McTeague's reshoots would end up costing the studio 10 million. At this point, they had the team that gave us The Matrix and V for Vendetta in control. The reshoots didn't take place until a year after production wrapped and were rumored to have lasted anywhere from three weeks to two months. And depending on if the rewrites were 30 or 70% of the film, 
More action sequences were added, along with a twist ending. Good, good. More twist endings. Who needs a cohesive storyline driven by the focus of one person? I don't know, say one director? Warner Brothers somehow believed that this direction would end well for everyone involved. And months later, they'd be singing a different tune that sounds a bit more like this. Yes, but I'm afraid I prematurely shot my wad on what was supposed to be a dry run, if you will, so now I'm afraid I have something of a mess on my hands. Now here's the thing, reshoots happen all the time. It's not very newsworthy, but it becomes more significant when the people involved are the Wachowskis. It sort of gives the impression that what was shot failed, an entirely new direction for the film was needed. Now the studio tried to avoid this narrative, but every comment on the matter led to further speculation. The director commented on the Wachowskis' involvement, saying, We had them come in and look at it with an original eye, and they came up with some surprisingly smart suggestions and went further in my direction. Some of their suggestions pissed me off because the pages were just better than what I had shot. Not long after this, the reshoots were in regular news headlines, but not in a positive light. During the reshoots, Kibben was involved in a car accident, and one that was actually caught on camera and published on TMZ.com. When she was later asked about the involvement of the Wachowskis, Kibben made the circumstances seem less than normal by admitting that in her long career, she had never taken part in reshoots, saying, I've never done that before in a film. No, I showed up and we shot three and a half weeks. It just is what it is. So finally, after the reshoots, the secrecy, and the behind the scenes drama, the invasion was released on August 17th, 2007. And to Warner Brothers' credit, it actually was quite different from the original film. In 56, the story really honed in on the small town paranoia that was so brilliantly written in the original novel. Now the stakes were raised in the follow-up in 78 by taking the story to the heart of San Francisco. In the invasion, the space shuttle Patriot crash lands on Earth. Through news reports, the audience is immediately handed the fact that the shuttle may have been contaminated. Make sure nobody touches it, nobody runs off with it. Why is it important for people not to touch it? It's contaminated, could be contaminated. And then they're immediately handed the fact that people have already made contact. Of course, we all got out and we touched it. Some of us did. After the shuttle crashes and debris scatters in different parts of the country, the CDC soon discovers that a fungus of some kind has attached itself to the shuttle. It's clearly some type of alien life form, but it doesn't seem to bother the CDC much. As director Tucker Kaufman, who I can only assume is named after Philip Kaufman, the director of the 1978 film, is actually cut by a piece of the ship found by a young girl but then just drops the debris and leaves. <laughs> he just leaves. Was Kaufman quarantined after contact with a fungus? Nope. Was the girl who carried the debris quarantined? No. Did he pick up and quarantine the debris that was covered in space fungus? No, <laughs> he just went home. The CDC didn't even acknowledge the girl trying to do the right thing. They didn't even acknowledge the girl at all. They just leave. Hell, at least say goodbye to her. What a bunch of a-holes. <laughs> We're then introduced to the film's protagonist, psychiatrist and ex-wife to Kaufman, Carol Bennell, who is weirded out by a patient of hers, played by Veronica Cartwright, who appeared in the 78 film, who claims that, My husband is not my husband. This is a nice little throwback to the 78 film. And this line seems to resonate with Benel as she begins to notice people in her life acting detached and impassive. Her son finds a weird, slimy patch of skin on a friend, and Benel gives it to a doctor to have it analyzed, believing it may be connected to the flu that's going around. Speaking of the flu, Benel's ex-husband speeds up the plot by sneaking in alien spores into the CDC's flu vaccine in order to spread the disease quicker. And spread it does. Before long, Carol is confronted by acquaintances, friends, co-workers, family. Hell, even the creepy little girl her son's friends with. Hey, let's speed this up. Long story short, Nicole Kidman gets puked on and infected. She steals her son back from her infected ex, and she struggles to stay awake. Since REM sleep is when the alien spores take over the brain. And hilarity ensues. Yes, this remake set itself apart from the versions of the film that came before. But... Unfortunately, so much of that was in a negative way. Personally, I was dismayed to see that the scream didn't exist in this version. But it is understood, knowing that it wanted to set itself apart and function on its own without relying on its predecessors. 
but the callbacks to previous films isn't what is missing here. The Invasion's biggest downside is assuming that its audience is composed of morons, unable to register what's implied on screen without having to explain through dialogue. But what was true about each version of the story remains true about the invasion. That the moments spent in fear of being caught or being surrounded by those who have already been turned are easily the most nail-biting and genuinely frightening of the entire film. This unfortunately is enough to redeem the film as it ranks as a clear loser in all the incarnations of the invasion. To bring in the big names that this film did, for all its efforts and rewrites and reshoots, for enlisting what was, at the time, arguably the most innovative directors around to handle said rewrites and reshoots, and for it all to fall so flat is a clear indication that this version should have never been. Because the end result was a failure in every aspect imaginable, the film holds an average of 19% on Rotten Tomatoes. BBC.com said, Having established an effectively creepy mood in the first half, with Nicole and Daniel Craig dodging zombies while popping amphetamines in a desperate attempt to stay awake. Yeah, we, uh, we know how you feel. Roger Deber called it the fourth and the least of the movies made from Jack Finney's classic science fiction novel. The audience score on Rotten Tomatoes was around 40%. It managed to pull in a 5.9 on IMDb, but couldn't manage higher than a combined 45 on Metacritic. The film was supposed to be released on June 2006, but because of reshoots, it was delayed until August of the following year. The original budget for the film was around 50, 55 million, but the reshoots were said to have raised it anywhere from 65 to a whopping 80 million. Unfortunately, the theatrical run would fail miserably to recoup that cost, as it earned just over 15 million in the US and just under 25 million in other countries, which brought its worldwide total to about 40 million. What audiences got away from this was obviously an extremely compromised movie, with too many cooks in the kitchen steering the purpose of the story into different directions in pre-production, production, and post-production. The ending was also the weakest of all the entries, settling on the happily ever after trope that a movie like this should be avoiding. The end result obviously had no impact on Kidman's career. The director made a few more Hollywood films like Diana with Naomi Watts, for example, before falling into obscurity, now directing one or two episode spots on Red MTV series. And while the movie obviously didn't send Daniel Craig into stardom, it was during his time making this movie that he was offered the role of James Bond in Casino Royale, and the rest they say is history. After the flop, it should be noted that Warner Brothers still does not currently believe that four incarnations are enough. They're hoping that a fifth time is a charm, as was announced in 2017, just 10 years after the invasion, that they intended to remake the classic tale yet again. This time around, it'll be written by David Taylor Johnson, who is a decent rep when it comes to horror, as he's known for such films as Orphan, Conjuring 2, and the upcoming reboot of A Nightmare on Elm Street. While some may be nervous about yet another reincarnation of the story, uh, who knows? With any luck, Warner Brothers could pull another fast one and send it straight to HBO Max. Hey, thanks for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Below Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends to like this sort of content and turn on the bell, you know the one, to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. You know, we're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.